Good afternoon. Boy, there is nothing like following three brilliant, inspirational, insightful, challenging preachers and then funny people <laughs> who have hyper characterized a know it all professor. Um, <laughs> so, I'm here today from, from Santa Clara University um, in California where we know everything about the death of the church. So, um, I'm going to talk about that. Um, so let me give you a little blueprint for what we're doing today. We're doing something a little bit uh, experimental and loose and um, we hope fun. Um, so I'm going to talk for a while because I always find that fun. Um, and um, then uh, toward the end, we're going to take a little break and we're going to ask you to reflect uh, for a couple minutes. Um, and then my um, good friend and colleague um, for many years who's been um, just a wonderful um, conversation partner and um, thinking inspirer um, throughout my, my career, um, Mary Hess of your own Luther Seminary, is going to come up and ask frightening, challenging, inspiring um, questions about some of the content by way of lubricating all our thinking for the breakout groups. Um, so, um, hopefully, I feel like I should have two other people finishing my sentences <laughs> with me. Um, that would be fun. Um, okay, so, um, last year I, I published a book called Choosing Our Religion, The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns. And most of y'all in this room will know that nuns, N-O-N-E-S's, are not like N-U-N nuns. They are the people who answer none when uh, survey takers ask them, with what religion are you affiliated or identified? And we know that in recent decades, um, especially since the 1990s, the percentage of the population who identify as religiously unaffiliated or nuns has risen quite dramatically, especially um, for people under age 30 um, who are now unaffiliated at a rate of about 35%. There's a little data blip in there that's actually not on this slide, but actually um, in the very last Pew U.S. Religious uh, Landscape Survey, uh, people between the ages of 30 and uh, 49 are actually higher, a little north of that, 37% unaffiliated. So, uh, of course, everybody here knows all of the anxieties associated with that. Um, I wanted to find out about the unaffiliated, um, not as um, kind of lost sheep, uh, prodigals, um, lapsed whatevers, um, but as, um, as they describe themselves. So I took several years and I traveled across the country, uh, went from Maine to Maui. Um, just a quick note, there's so much research to be done on religion and spiritual life in Maui in particular, <laughs> that if anyone <laughs> would like to fund that, I will drop everything and go. Um, so I feel like I just touched on it. So I, I wanted to, to hear the stories of, of nuns. I wanted them to talk about their own spiritualities um, rather than have it narrated through the lens of, of the religiously affiliated. So I talked to uh, more than 100 uh, nuns across the country from Maine to Maui and I also um, surveyed about a thousand people about 20 percent of whom um, were religiously unaffiliated and the rest were religiously affiliated of some sort so I'll talk about some of some of that data um, when I was writing the book um, and doing the interviews um, I had to learn a sort of different practice of listening. 
I started out listening to the stories doing some task interviews with nuns, and, and as you might guess, when I asked them the very simple question, how would you describe your spiritual life? Some people said things that made me, as a mainline Christian, involuntarily do things like roll my eyes <laughs> um, or begin twitching a little bit. And so I had to kind of learn to set that aside and say, I just really want to hear this. And after a while, I kind of developed a little bit of Stockholm Syndrome, um, where I could no longer listen to people in my Episcopal church talk about church anymore, because I just thought it was like so dead, right? <laughs> um, and so what would Deepak say about that? Um, and, I, and that was great for writing the book. But a year later, I've been able to reflect on things I heard in those conversations with nuns that at the time I might have wanted to say, you know there are other churches. Uh, or there are different ways this has happened in Christian traditions. But I didn't. I kind of just set those aside. I'd write them on a note card. And so my thoughts today are really about what I learned from nuns that I think is telling us something about where the church might be going. Yeah. So, one of the things we know about the growth of the nuns is it used to be the case that everybody thought um, all the nuns were in the Pacific Northwest, which was called the Nun Zone um, for a long time, or the West Coast, or the East Coast, right? So it was this coastal uh, hipster um, vibe. And in the Midwest here, you all were just loving the Lord and going to church on Sunday, right? Um, well, it turns out that it, over the last 10 years, the rate of religious unaffiliation and disidentification has grown in every demographic group, among women, among men, among uh, those with uh, college educations and those with high school educations among every racial category, among every socioeconomic group, and in every geographic area. In fact, while it's still the case that um, the coasts have a higher percentage of nuns, the fastest rate of unaffiliation, nearly doubling um, between 1990 and 2015, is in the Bible Belt. Um, those are also, that's also, just this is a note, just a little aside, that's also the place in the country with the highest, um, uh, where the, the sales of the book uh, Fifty Shades of Grey sold the most. Um, <laughs> so, may or may not be related. Okay, so one of the things, there's a lot of eye chart business in this because I am a professor, right? Um, so. One of the things we, we sometimes ask about is, well, how are these nuns different from what I came to call sums, people who still have some religion left, right? So one of the things that's important to think about is that 70% of the religiously unaffiliated come from a Christian background. Um, so they were raised in churches. And what that means is that we need to think about our own churches as factories for unaffiliation, right? It's, it's not the culture, right? It's not Beyonce. Um, it's, it's not Kendrick Lamar. It's not whoever. Um, you know, it's, it's not the Real Housewives. Maybe a little bit. Um, <laughs> Something's happening in our churches that's facilitating the growth in nuns, right? So that's one thing. The other interesting thing is that most people um, in the general public, when they talk about the religiously unaffiliated, they think about atheists and agnostics. Um, and the percentage of atheists and agnostics, those people who don't believe in any 
um, supernatural being or force or those people who are not resolved on the question but don't necessarily think it's an important question has gone up a little bit, but it's still at around 5 to 7% of the population. The majority of nuns believe in God or a life force or a higher power or whatever, as many of the people I talked to um, told me. Um, and, um, you know, they, they have practices that um, nurture their understanding of the presence of that God or life force or supernatural um, power um, in their lives. About uh, a quarter to a third of the religiously unaffiliated attend religious services um, on at least a couple, every couple monthly basis, at least a few times a year. The religiously affiliated, and you'll see that there's an asterisk on that, report that they attend religious services almost um, <clears throat> on a regular basis, almost 80% of them say that they, they do that. We know from other research by a guy named Kirk Hansen that the religiously unaffiliated are <sighs> fibbers uh, <laughs> at the rate of about 50%. So the religiously, unaffili uh, religiously affiliated and those of you who've ever been to a church or maybe even pastored one will know that people are, will overrepresent their attendance, their participation, and their giving, especially, uh, <laughs> by about twice as much, right? So, so although they report at 76% at um, that they go fairly often, it's about half that much. Um, the unaffiliated um, don't really have as much motivation to fib about that, right? So it's maybe a more reliable number. Um, when you ask the unaffiliated, including atheists and agnostics, um, whether they pray on a regular basis, um, about 40% of them will say that they do, and about 85% of the religiously affiliated say that they pray on a regular basis, Hansen effect. Think about that too. Um, about 40% of the religiously unaffiliated say that they meditate, about half of the affiliated. Um, most recently, Pew asked people, do you regularly feel a sense of spiritual well-being? And you'll see the numbers starting to get closer together. The affiliated and the unaffiliated are close to 80%. Pew asked, do you, how, do you regularly feel a sense of awe and wonder? Again, numbers identical. And here's a really interesting piece. Um, Boston University sociologist Nancy Ammerman asked people, both the affiliated and the unaffiliated, whether they see themselves as more spiritual uh, than religious. The affiliated and the unaffiliated came in at exactly the same level about 70%. Now, one of the things that we see in all of this data um, is that the affiliated and the unaffiliated become more alike when we start to move into religious or spiritual practices that focus not on belief, but on felt experience, right? Um, they get closer when they move from things that involve um, being in a collaborative, collective gathering to things that can be done individually, they move closer together. This goes a little bit further. In my research, I, I uh, surveyed about 1,000 people, and I asked them to describe um, uh, things that they found spiritually meaningful. I'd done a bunch of focus groups, we came up with a long inventory, and then I did this survey. In fact, um, I sent the survey out uh, over a weekend, <clears throat> excuse me, just to test the questions. I sent it out to 20 of my friends and said, please send this out to about 10 or 20 people you know that I don't know, just so I can see if I got the questions right. 
and I actually had to upgrade my SurveyMonkey account over the weekend because I had the free one, so I had to pay money, um, because I got almost 1,100 responses to it. People were so interested in talking about what was spiritually meaningful to them. So about 20% of these people were nuns, about 80% were sums, and what's interesting about this is that the things that they valued, and I call these the four F's of contemporary spirituality, family, friends, Fido, and food, um, were the same for both nuns and some. So they said, enjoying time with family, spending time for family, with family, caring for family, that's the most spiritually meaningful thing. It looks like some care about their families more, um, but the fact is that they're more often married um, than are nuns, so they're just stuck with them more. So they're making the most of that. That's why they like their dogs a little bit more, too. Okay. Um, so enjoying time with friends, both groups, that's spiritually meaningful. Sharing and preparing food, equally meaningful um, for both groups. Um, and then enjoying time with pets or other animals, um, very meaningful for both groups. The only conventional religious practice that came into the top 10 was prayer, right? Which is kind of the mobile technology of religion. Um, doesn't require institutional authorization, though it may be. So what we see in this is that nuns and sums, though we're, we're accustomed through media reports to think of them as very, very different, actually exist on the same continuum of lived spirituality, of what it's like to do it day to day and to feel it in their lives. I'm going to skip over here and get water, which I meant to bring with me. You can have a moment to sip yourselves if you'd like. Okay, so I, that was a lot of data. There's going to be a brief quiz later. Um, so why don't you just take, a, just take a minute, kind of think about that, and just in your head for a second, just kind of note what stands out for you in that. What seems surprising or maybe troubling, and maybe most importantly, what's exciting? What allows you to rethink church in that data? Let's make a couple notes about that, either in your head or on your paper. While I hydrate. Okay, let's move on a little. Now, although there's this um, continuum of spirituality and religiosity on which nuns and sums alike participate, one of the differences that's significant is the way in which nuns and sums gather and part of that gathering has to do with different ways of approaching sameness and difference. Um, I actually have a um, graduate student in, in psychology who's doing some studies on whether the religiously unaffiliated, to what degree the religiously unaffiliated and the religiously affiliated value novelty, their psychological measures, of, of novelty, and so she's looking at, at that as a factor. Um, not sure how that'll turn out, and there are lots of questions about that kind of research, but it's really clear among the unaffiliated that I talk to that sameness um, is problematic um, in a way that it isn't for the, for the affiliated, right? It seems not just problematic, but silly. Um, to engage, to, to the unaffiliated, to engage in the same religious practice over a lifetime. And what's more, 
when those 70% of the unaffiliated were in church services, they felt profoundly constrained by those experiences. They felt like not only was church an experience of sameness over and over and over again, but all the people were the same. Right? And we, we know this demographically. To find um, a church that has a real range in terms of, of age, class, ethnicity, um, you know, life experience is really difficult, right? And so that's really uncomfortable for a lot of the, the unaffiliated. Now, it's not surprising that they would they would experience um, religion as its most robust when there are multiple expressions of it that they can engage and that they'd feel that constrained in church circumstances. Nancy Ammerman did what I refer to as the most important study that churches ignored uh, about 20 years ago on what she called Golden Rule Christianity. And she looked at a range of churches across the country, across denominational descriptions, and from liberal to conservative. And she asked people, what would you think of as the essence of Christianity? And they all said, the golden rule. And what she found was that those churches that embraced this golden rule theology um, had a mode of communitarian, communitarianism, a mode of gathering and staying together that allowed them to be really, really good at taking care of people just like them. The benefit of which was they were really good at caring for their children, good at caring for the elderly, good at reaching out a little bit to maybe other congregations in their communities to connect with them, or people who seem to be like them. But they had a relatively narrow circle of care. They were not interested in doing big world-changing things or in bringing in people who are very different from them. Right? Um, 20 years ago, um, nobody read it. <laughs> right? Um, this is sort of, because it seems so nice, the golden rule. Right? But the thing about the golden rule, do unto others, right, as you would have done to you, is it takes you as the measure. Right? What I would want is the measure. There are lots of interpretations of the rule, but that's the biblical reading of it. And for, for nuns, that reads as churches taking care of their own. Now, um, in this case, this nun that I, I t talked with you know, talked about, you know, there are big organizations that do caring uh, type activities, that do justice work, maybe Habitat for Humanity, but you never see it in churches. We know that's not true, right? We know that the light of that work, the, the volunteerism, the compassionate action, the social justice work, all of that is hidden under bushels for lots of different reasons. That story doesn't get out there. But that's what it feels like to the unaffiliated. And even in churches with very active um, ministries in the world in all kinds of ways, in their congregations, that is not often a focus of the story they tell about themselves. Um, right? So we narrow that to we're really about ourselves, and also we buy mosquito nets once in a while. Whoops. So here's the thing about that. What this can make it seem like is nuns like all this diversity, this difference, they're allergic to sameness, and some are really closed in and shut down, and they only take care of themselves. But here's another little bit of data. Pew looked at, at and they didn't look at nuns, they only looked at the religiously unaffiliated, and what they found is that it turns out that the religiously unaffiliated like multiple experiences of religious and spiritual engagement, too. Um, this is um, the survey is from 2009, so it's about 10 years old. My guess is it hasn't been repeated, 
but that these numbers are even higher. That among the religiously affiliated, at the level of personal spirituality, they really enjoy connecting with other expressions of spiritual practice and spiritual um, engagement with the world. So it turns out, too, that, again, nuns and sums, not so different, and our lives are entwined, right? We go to graduation parties and weddings and family dinners and baptisms and political protests and all kinds of things where both nuns and sums are together. It's not like we live segregated lives. So we interact with each other all the time. So what we're seeing, I think, is what um, Sean Rowe, who's an Episcopal bishop of northwestern Pennsylvania, said was like, oh, nuns are canaries in the cathedral. They're telling us where we need to change, where we need to grow. And one of the ways that we're seeing that, or several of the ways that we're seeing this, has to do with, first of all, the top of that first data list, all those ways of measuring being religious that have to do with believing in particular ways. We're moving away from that. Religion, the bottom of that list of things that nuns and sums have in common, the religion and spirituality, religion feels like something. It feels like something in our bodies. It feels like something in our relationships with others. It feels like something in the issues that we care about in the world. It feels less and less about creedal statements of belief. Right? Secondly, there's a movement away from rituals, formal rituals, toward practices of everyday life, like the four Fs, right? The things that we're doing in relation to others. And finally, not finally yet, third, before I get to the big one, um, third, there's this idea that once we have a religious identity, I'm an Episcopalian, or I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm a Lutheran, it's fixed for life. Right? We all know that in our faith journeys, there are moments where, I mean, there are times when I am just like so Episcopalian, and there are times when I'm not so much, right? Um, but we've used that labeling to mask that. One of the things nuns have done is to peel off the label and say, this is not about some kind of fixed identity, it's about who I am and who I am becoming. And that cannot be labeled easily because it's a process. And finally, I'm going to spend more time on this today. There are different modes of belonging that move from the communitarianism we saw in the Golden Rule Christian communities to a cosmopolitanism that's more characteristic of something I saw among the nuns, who many of whom had a deep attachment to the story of the Good Samaritan. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I want to start, though, by saying this cosmopolitanism is totally in our wheelhouse. Christianity is, a, is inherently a cosmopolitan religion. It is actually not a communitarian religion. The ministry of Jesus was a road trip right? It moves from place to place. It engages different people. It um, is challenged by different boundary crossings. Um, and as Paul tried in the, in, the, in the early churches, he was trying to construct it. He came to understand that inviting engagement with different people meant giving up this idea of us and them, of foreigners and strangers, but it involves something else too. Most of you will probably be familiar with this passage and you'll know that right before it, what comes right before it, this is when Paul says circumcision is no longer necessary. It's no longer a critical part of our identity in Christ. 
What he is saying is that something that was a foundational part of Jewish identity, we're going to give that up so we can be in relationship with more people. That's a huge challenge. We have tended in the tradition to focus on how do we all get into this household? How do we all be known by Christ and not what might we have to give up that feels fundamental to our identity, foundational, critical, in order to invite more people into relationship with us. But we have that, right? And the nuns I talked to, I was so surprised when I said to nuns, tell me about who are the, the spiritual exemplars for you, who are the people, the figures that are important to you, more than half of them said the Jesus of the Gospels. More than half of them. Um, I talked with a woman um, in Marin County in California who had this funky altar that had, you know, stones and bird feathers and um, a bong and um, different kinds of paintings, the Dalai Lama, whatever, and an icon of Jesus as the Good Samaritan. And she said, you know, this symbol is so important to me. She had been raised as an Episcopalian, left the church, no plan of coming back, not coming back, but that story was important to her. Because of course, unlike the Golden Rule, the ethic of the Good Samaritan is an openness to the other, adaptation to what the other needs, what's important to that person, not what's important to me. So another woman I, I talked with said, you know, these stories, and this is critical, are important. It's not the beliefs, it's the exchange of stories that allow us to develop a common vocabulary for moral, ethical, and spiritual practice. <clears throat> The philosopher Kwame Anthea Appiah talks about cosmopolitanism as engaging these stories through dialogue with the recognition that we're never going to come to one common conclusion, right? It's the story exchange, the conversation, the dialogue for Appiah is critical Right? So what he's saying here is not just, and then you go your own way, and we're done with you. What he's saying is that we need to exchange stories, be in com conversation, and allow that you may never come to agree with what I have to say. I may never convert you to my way of seeing and being in the world, and that's okay that we can still be in the same world together and still value each other. That's the practice of cosmopolitanism. Now, there, I'm sorry about this one. I couldn't help myself. Um, this is for the essay exam. So, uh, now, when we talk about cosmopolitanism, it's worth, and by the way, I lost my clock on here, so you'll jump up when I'm getting in a bad timey place and go, please, for the love of God and everything holy, stop. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so it's, it's good to distinguish, though, between kinds of cosmopolitanism. Um, and I'm drawing here um, on the work of Ulrich Beck, who's a German sociologist. And Beck talks about there being a philosophical cosmopolitanism, which is the sort of enlightenment idea of global um, harmony, and respect sort of the Hume, Locke stuff that, it's not bad stuff, right? Kant and Thomas Mann and then later Hannah Arendt. Um, and it's sort of what gives us the idea of cosmopolitan that goes with that sweet pink vodka cocktail. You know, it's like chic and sophisticated. It's things that smart people do, they're cosmopolitan, right? In this way of having this great openness. That's not really what we're talking about here, although in the best sense of it, there's lots of good stuff there. What we're talking about is a kind of lived cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism, where <clears throat> life itself 
is lived in difference. And that means there's a kind of cosmopolitanism that isn't always chosen. Philosophical cosmopolitanism is a chosen, I'm going to be more cosmopolitan, I'm going to be more accepting. But for many people in the world, immigrants, refugees, migrants, those on the margins of society, LGBTQ people, um, people of color, cosmopolitanism happens to them. Um, if, you're a, if you're a young gay person in many parts of this country and you want to hang out with people like you and you go to places where you think there are going to be a lot of gay people, San Francisco or whatever, you are coming into a cosmopolitan world because all the LGBT people there might have in common that they're LGBTQ, but they're also of different races, classes, educational backgrounds. And so in order to feel valued and whole as an LGBTQ person, you have to develop a cosmopolitan sensibility. It's not a philosophical ideal. It's a thing you got to do, right? If you're an immigrant um, and you want to be uh, successful in where you've landed, you're going to have to learn quickly about languages and cultures that aren't your own, right? Um, nuns as well have this kind of lived cosmopolitanism in the sense that they have this abundant curiosity about things religious and spiritual, and they're not finding that need being met in their churches. Now, we've seen that the affiliated, who are inching toward the back door, um, have this itch as well, this cosmopolitan itch, right? And for nuns, this sort of like everyday quotidian cosmopolitanism can be really banal. It can be thin and shallow. It can be watching Oprah's Soul Sunday and then having cappuccinos with your friends at Starbucks, which we know is very popular, right? <laughs> um, right? It can be that. The question is, how do you move that lived cosmopolitanism, the experience of on a daily basis living with difference in the world and contending creatively, with it. How do you move that into something that is a transformational force in the world? When I think about the anxiety that people have about the religiously unaffiliated, I can tell you, um, I don't care whether they're coming back to your churches in order to keep your churches uh, going, in order to keep you employed. I don't care. But I do care about the transformative potential of the kingdom of God in Christ that is meant to be affected by our churches. I was telling Mary earlier, on the day after the election this year, I woke up in the morning, and the first thing I thought, and I shocked myself thinking this, is, I don't even know, I, there were a lot of cuss words, and I'm editing them out right now. How do we deal with this without the churches. If the churches are dying, how do we actually take action? Beck talks about the need for an institutional con cosmopolitanism where there's a structure in society to engage difference, to cultivate the capacity to interact with others, to think with others, um, to work with others toward transformation in ways that engage universal concerns. What does he mean by universal concerns? He doesn't mean salvation in the sense of I go to heaven, right? What he means is universally we are all implicated in the status of the, the environment on the planet. That's a concern for all of us. Right? Whether you believe in climate change or not, you know, if you're in Florida in 10 years, it's not going to really matter. Right? Um, um, whether, you know, uh, human rights, that's a, that's a universal concern. Ending poverty, that's a universal concern. So institutionalizing practices of developing dialogues that embrace difference 
and enrich the spiritual connection people have to each other, that, I think, is the work of the church. Whether or not it looks like the buildings that we have now, or the structures, whether we're in bars and Starbucks and parks and all kinds of other places or not, it's not really about the where we are, it's about how we're doing it, uh, how we're shaping it. Okay, so there are lots of ways that people are beginning to do that. I'm going to do this right now. People are beginning to do that. Um, in an area near where I live, uh, a group of churches and other people gather every Friday night and walk through some uh, at-risk neighborhoods, meeting neighbors. Um, I know I wasn't here yesterday, but I understand that one of the presenters talked about being a, taking the attitude of being a guest in the world. This is what they're doing. What does it mean to go every Friday into a neighborhood that has all kinds of different issues, crime issues, safety issues, and get to know people? Um, students on my campus um, were looking for options in my Christian tradition class to not have to go to church. One of my graduate students came with, up with an opportunity for them to go hang out on Friday nights and share food with homeless people. Um, it became the most popular thing to do on campus for 18-year-olds on a Friday night, not just the sharing of food, but the having conversation, actually meeting homeless people. Um, many of you will know Luther's Table in Renton, Washington, which transformed space in order to have different kinds of conversations, turn to church into a cafe. And finally, just very quickly, um, Emmanuel Episcopal Church in Boston is also the home of reform, Central Reform Temple. No one's getting converted, right, when Central Reform Temple does their Shabbat service on Friday night. But people from both congregations come and transformation is happening. So there's lots of opportunities to do that. We, we're going to talk more about this during, we can talk more about this during the breakout, um, but, so we'll save this. But I wanted to invite, um, Mary and I often have conversations on Facebook where we disagree in, I think, beautiful ways. Generally, Mary will say something and I'm more cantankerous and I'll say, nah, no. Uh, <laughs> And we'll, we'll go back and forth on it for two or three days, and people will join in. Um, but I think it models a kind of dialogue that can be pr productive, and I thank Mary for that. And I wanted to invite her up to begin to kind of prime the pump for how we could think about this kind of cosmopolitanism. Mary. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, but one of the things I was thinking about is that you talk a lot about story. And you also mention the extent to which folks who are inhabiting this space find narrative engagement really powerful. I'm really conscious that this is maybe the seminary professor in me, that creeds at one point in time were the most powerful stories in our tradition. And for some reason now, they're not even ever experienced that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. Um, does belief come into this at all? Are there sort of hidden beliefs that these folks are living with mm -hmm. that they're drawing on? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are a couple things I would respond to in that. One of the things has to do with the nature of identity as we understand it now. It's not accidental that the idea of identity is a fixed boundaried thing, right? Uh, what, Charles Taylor calls the, the boundaried self, was invented at the same time that nation states were being invented with hard boundaries around them. And before that, identity was more porous, and it was shaped through stories, right? Like creeds. How do we come to act this way? What is it that we think about 
God and how God is present with us, or the divine, or the holy, or, or whatever. What experiences did we have? And all of that um, was shared conversationally, right? And then the creed was the aftermath of that. We came to worship the sort of codifying of these long conversations. So of course, among the unaffiliated and, and the sons that are out going to, you know, a Buddhist Shanga on Saturday evening and, you know, um, somewhere, somewhere else, a Wiccan service on, on you know, the, the eclipse on the 21st, right, uh, whatever, while going to church. They're actually, all of them are sharing these stories. We're not codifying it in the same way, so it doesn't feel as fixed. Right? So I think when we think, yes, there's creedal understandings, they're like this valuing of difference, that's really the creed of the nuns, right? Is that uh, diversity, uh, the sharing of wisdom, um, you know, the, the mixing and matching of things in order to respond reflexively to the demands of everyday life, that's their creed. But their creed is also, you know, one of the, one of the people I interviewed who was from Hawaii, willing to go back um, to follow this up, um, said, you know, anytime I get too attached to an idea, I let it go. I let it go. And that's certainly a creedal statement, but it's also a practice. So the question for us, I think, is how do we take our creedal statements and animate them in everyday practice, not Sunday practice, everyday practice? One of the things that encourages me about what you've said um, is the the statistics, the 75% that experience awe and wonder mm -hmm. um, in both of those categories. And I'm also struck by the comment you made at one point, um, or maybe it was in the paper, I don't remember, but the <laughs> piece about how narrative engagement, right, approaching through story, helps us to hold and then release differences and conflicts rather than mute them or resolve them. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend who's a physician who pointed out to me one day that when you disagree with somebody, there's a very primitive part of your brain that gets sort of mm -hmm. um, activated, and it's the fight, flight, or freeze piece of who you are. Mm -hmm. But that there's another part of your brain that can, that's a quote unquote more evolved part, that uh, can overcome that, right? And mm -hmm. that part of your brain is activated by wonder. Mm -hmm. So there's this piece of me that's, that is curious about whether or not some of the folks who, by circumstance perhaps, not even necessarily choice, mm -hmm. have found themselves in this cosmopolitan space, something has allowed them to live in wonder. Right. Something has allowed them to engage in wonder. And now you are a scholar of church things. You know all sorts about spirituality and all the, you know, sort of historically. Are there resources or pieces in the Christian long story over time that maybe we ought to be retrieving a bit that might help us engage wonder more? Absolutely. I mean, do. certainly in, in the Christian tradition of, of mysticism, there's all kinds of stuff. And lots of, you know, I talked to a guy who was a Buddhist practitioner, uh, was an oblate of an order in, I think, somewhere in Colorado, um, didn't think, identified as an atheist otherwise, and said, you know, um, I, I, I didn't know until I started hanging out with these Benedictines that there was all this mysticism stuff. I would have loved that, but it's too late for me now. I just go hang out with them because they're quiet uh, and they, you know, make good food. And, you know, he was doing Buddhist practice and other kinds of things. Yes, we tend to so elevate what happens in the worship service that we miss other elements of the tradition that do nurture that space of wonder and we demean wonder, right? So there was a, many of you probably read this a few years ago, uh, and I, um, I like her in lots of other ways, Lillian Daniel, who's a UCC pastor, had written an article in HuffPo called something like, so you, you find wonder in nature, you bore me, or not, you know, I'm spiritual but not religion, religious, you bore me. And the idea was, Yes, we all love to see the ocean or love to see the forest and we feel connected to all things. Big deal, try running a congregation. You know, that's some work, right? And well, I, I think it expressed a certain frustration that people in church communities have. It also demeans this sense of awe and wonder and fullness 
um, again to use Charles Taylor's language for it, that people experience in everyday life when they're hanging out with their kids, when they're playing with the dog, when they're baking bread and sharing it with their neighbors and doing all of those kinds of things. And, and we call that not committed, vapid, shallow. Throughout the tradition, we have all of these kinds of things. It's not like hanging with family, friends, animals, um, and sharing, pre preparing food is outside of our tradition, right? The communion table is a communion table because it comes from a meal, not the other way around. We don't eat dinner because there was Eucharist. We do Eucharist because there was dinner, right? And so it, throughout the tradition, there are both resources that are more to, you know, overtly spiritual, but also within our everyday lives, there are all kinds of resources that we can claim the spiritual in. Parker Palmer writes that when you stand in the tragic gap, and for him that's a label that I think I translate into my head into a standing in an awareness of the kingdom of God, basically that, that the already not yet, mm -hmm. that when you stand in the tragic gap, your heart will be broken. Flat out says that. His question is, is your heart going to be broken open or broken into shards? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if in your experiences of all of these folks that you've been interviewing, have they, do you have the sense of being broken open or do you have a sense that something is breaking into shards? I, I'll, I'll tell you what the, one of the, the most spiritually significant things for me in this whole experience of talking with nuns for almost three years was, um, and that was how grateful people were to me for allowing them to share their perspectives on their spirituality. I mean, I talked with people with four, for four, sometimes six hours. Some of them still email me. No one in their life, for the most part, seemed interested in having this conversation with them. And if they did, it was about... Um, you know, wanting them to come back into the church or what was wrong with their spirituality. I, I was, I'm just estimating right now, probably half of the people that I talked to, men and women across the spectrum, wept at some point during our conversation. And so one of the ministries that I think is really important is a ministry of listening, of just being in dialogue with people, just hearing their stories, not directing them, not proclaiming them, um, just listening, um, and I think that's the place where the heart opens. Um, you know, two of the people that I interviewed went back to their church communities after they went through that process, um, one to a different church community, one to a Lutheran church that his wife, the guy's wife had been going to because he felt like, oh, I have a way to see who I am in this continuum. Um, so I think that there are ways that we can practice opening. Um, I think the hearts are opening. I think we can be there with that opening. I know we don't have much time. Um, one of the things that I'm conscious of, you know, you and I both do a lot of work around digital media. Mm -hmm. And lately I've been doing a lot of thinking about games and how they shape learning. And there's a lot of research that suggests that people increasingly are learning to learn in the middle of games. And I was intrigued as you were talking um, to think about these connections, right? So folks who talk about the learning that takes place in games talk about it's learning-centered, it's often tacit kinds of knowing, um, it's often a search for esoteric info, mm -hmm. okay? Some people um, summarize that by saying it's about exploration, memory, and mentoring. And as I was thinking about your categories of either um, the, the communitarian church of believing and behaving mm -hmm. versus being and becoming, mm -hmm. that this whole um, being and becoming pattern is both very ancient in Christian history and maybe we're in a period of time because of the ways people are being socialized that makes us newly open mm -hmm. to this kind of space. And I can't help, I have to ask you a digital media question. Where do you see in the middle of the plethora, I mean, you've written a couple of really wonderful books about digital media and pastoral ministry. I highly recommend them. Um, where do you see that emerging right now? Like, are there things that are constructively helpful in social media or on the web or? 
Well, I mean, I think that certainly that practice of listening is not constrained to, you know, geographical space, right? Um, and so the places, I mean, I, you know, I talk about this in, in one of those books, maybe two of them. Um, you know, the places that, if you go onto Twitter and just, you know, search for prayer, you'll find millions of people to listen to um, there, to, to learn about what ordinary people are experiencing in their lives, or if you put in spiritual, I may have to weed out a lot of churchy stuff, but when you get down to real people talking about their experience, it's there. So those kinds of exchanges are happening, and people are ministering to each other. So I think that that's, I think one of the big learnings for me was, it's not like nuns are going, and then they're done. They're not spiritual, they're not religion, they've religious, they've tuned it out. It's they're doing this learning on their own um, and with each other, and certainly digital social media allows that to happen in many, many ways. Um, and many of us in the church are not participating in that because we consider it less than other ways of being spiritual and religious in the world. I was one more. Say, maybe one more time. Okay. Um, Yesterday, Ralph talked about what does it mean to be sent out, to be guest, um, peace be upon you, to be in those spaces. And Kara talked at one point about um, what does it mean to take, instead of the fear, to live into the, um, the glimpse of joy that might come as a way of responding to that fear. And I'm, I'm really curious about where your own hope comes from in the middle of, because there's something that kept you, you were at this book for a long time. I mean, you were in those conversations for a long time, Stockholm Syndrome or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, but, but looking forward, right? Looking at this whole crowded set of people here who are trying to accompany folks. But what gives you hope? What, what lives, where's the hope that you find in the middle of what you're doing? I mean, in the, we're living in a highly polarized society right now. Mm -hmm. And, and there are ways in which people not only don't listen to each other, they have no respect to even begin to listen to each other, and yet you went and listened to all these folks. Mm -hmm. what, what helps you do that? Um, well, there, I mean, I think, I think it, you know, I think conversations like these give me hope. Occasions like this where people are coming together, and the more of those we can do, the better. I think that, um, and this is a part of a social media thing, I think we can model healthier ways of, of sharing stories and listening and not expecting conversion, um, not even desiring it, um, just listening. I think we can do that in all kinds of ways. And when I see that happen, um, I'm gratified by that. I'm really gratified by that. Um, I see too, you know, I teach 18 to 22 year olds, so um, I have a colleague and I who are like our grand life plan, our sort of pinky in the brain plan is how to monetize our students. You know, I, I'm, you know, we now, our students now go and do field work in local religious communities. We're mapping the Northern California, we're developing a geo map of, of sacred spaces and religious communities in, in Northern California, and then we take over the world. Um, and our students are really engaged in collecting stories, being in conversation. Um, I, I could rent them to local churches just so they have six 18 to 22 year olds every Sunday, they're at least on picture taken day. Um, they are unlikely to stay, but they love being in the conversation. They love that moving, and that gives me great hope, and when I talk with local religious leaders across the religious spectrum and the denominational spectrum, you know, they've really, over the last couple of years that we've made this shift, we've, they've really had to learn how to not want the people who walk in the door to become part of the furniture, to become fixtures. Um, they've learned, they've had to learn how to be cosmopolitan with them as well, to just let them be there. And the fact that there's a willingness to do the more than when I started the book, you know, maybe five years ago and I was talking with people, it was like, well, let's get people in. How can we capture them? I don't know how many people use the word capture. 
because everybody wants to be a captive of Jesus, right? Um, who doesn't, right? So it's not about that. It's about being in relationship. So it gives me hope that I see a willingness to do that. And it may not be across the ideological spectrum, but I think it's moving more. And I think that's hopeful. I think for those of us who are committed to um, peace and love and justice and participating in the making of the kingdom, um, and if I, I just see no point to Christianity if it's not about that. I'm out if it's not about that. Um, it, you know, I think for those of us who are committed to that, if we keep doing that, there's a lot of hopefulness. Um, Thanks. Thank you.